China-U.S. tensions are heating up. I spoke exclusively to former U.S. Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers and the British scholar Martin Jakes to unpack the root of the problem and sanctions, the pandemic and 5G. No field seems immune from China-U.S. tensions. Does repairing China-U.S. ties need more than just a new face? in the White House. Welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Li Xin. <music> Distrust, suspicion and mutual accusations. The relationship between the world's two largest economies, China and the U.S., has been deteriorating, propelled by the Huawei affair, the coronavirus, and the trade tensions, among other things. Yet this relationship, more than any other, is central to the way the world works. Is it possible, as some are saying, that a new Cold War is underway? In a previous interview, I talked to Lawrence Summers, former Treasury Secretary of the United States, to get his views. The impression he gave was that the relationship could be on the point of breaking. Giving his perspective on that interview today is Martin Jakes, until recently a senior fellow at Cambridge University's Department of Politics and International Studies, and author of the book, When China rules the world. Welcome, Martin, as always. But first of all, let's hear what Mr. Summers told me about what's causing tension between China and the United States. I think there has been a general reassessment of the U.S.-China relationship in the United States. Uh, some of that is, as uh, your foreign minister suggests, uh, a product of um, nationalist forces uh, within the United States, but some of it is a response to uh, what China is doing in Hong Kong. Some of it is a response to Chinese uh, failing to live up to commitments it made with respect to cyber activities uh, in the United States. Some of it is a reflection of the mistreatment of American businesses operating uh, in uh, China. Some of it is a reflection of some very heated uh, rhetoric that has come out of uh, China. So I'm not going to suggest that uh, American policy has been consistently as I would prefer it uh, to be. I'm not going to suggest that there have been no mistakes uh, in the United States. But I don't think that China is unfortunately in a position to claim uh, the moral high ground uh, here. There are a variety of traditionally accepted uh, red lines that uh, China has crossed uh, in its rhetoric and uh, in its actions that have created anxiety, not just in the United States, but in many other parts of the world. So, Martin, the former U.S. Treasury Secretary's list of accusations against China is long, and uh, the impression that is that I got is that uh, uh, pretty much uh, China is to blame for the kind of reactions that it is experiencing in different parts of the world. Do you share his perspective, or how much do you share his perspective? Well, what struck me about uh, that clip was that, um, you know, to use an English phrase, uh, you know, he sort of threw the kitchen sink at China. Um, I mean, you, you can't say that the reason for the deterioration is, you know, is Hong Kong, because this deterioration, well, predates the Hong Kong situation. Um, you know, I think that what uh, Lawrence Summers' contribution uh, reflects is a big shift in American opinion. It's not just Trump. It's also uh, members of uh, previous Democratic uh, administrations. Uh, and uh, now why? Why has there been this big shift? 
I don't really uh, buy uh, uh, Larry Summers' argument uh, that uh, uh, it's a, just a collection of issues. Um, I think that something bigger has happened, and that bigger is what I would describe as hegemonic angst in the United States. Its, it's position shifted because it began to worry about China's rise. Previously, the United States had believed that uh, the relationship was essentially uh, in its interests and was benign, and China would not become an economic threat, and China would become like a Western country, and so on. And that has not happened. So, the, the, so actually, there's some deep underlying reasons for the American shift. And, uh, and this explains why it's not just Trump, although Trump, of course, is the most aggressive um, and unreasonable of this position, uh, but it's across, uh, largely across the whole American spectrum. Well, I also asked Mr. Summers what both sides need to do now in order to defuse tensions, and he also touched upon um, how China's behavior has drastically changed. Uh, international economic orders or international orders in general. Let's take a listen to, to this. I think both sides need to stop vilifying uh, the other side. Both sides need to act with respect uh, towards uh, the other side. Both sides need to recognize that um, we are two people in a lifeboat, in a turbulent sea, a long way from shore. And it doesn't matter precisely what our feelings are. It doesn't really matter what capacity we have to damage each other. We're only going to get to shore if we achieve a measure of uh, cooperation. And we both be, need to be prepared to do what is necessary uh, to achieve that. And part of that is respecting each other's most uh, fundamental and uh, important uh, interests. That goes to the kind of cyber activities that your country has mounted inside of mine that may go to provocations that uh, the United States may have engaged in uh, that uh, were, uh, were excessive. But I don't think uh, the kind of um, rhetoric uh, that becomes very confrontational is uh, helpful in either direction. Totally agreed. And I think in yeah. general, mm -hmm. when people try to disrupt in a major way the existing order, that is likely to be seen as provocative. That's a position that sure. China takes with respect to declarations of independence from uh, Taiwan, but it's a position that China, I believe, needs to respect more as it contemplates very substantial change in uh, political relationships uh, in uh, Hong Kong. There are, That's something China yeah. needs to consider as it uh, seeks uh, to dramatically change um, the nature of uh, international economic uh, relations. According to Mr. Summers, China is either trying or China seeking to dramatically change the nature of international economic relations or disrupting the existing international order. Who defines that order and do you agree with his perspective? There's a bigger problem which uh, is stalking uh, the American uh, 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 approach on all these things, you see which is um, absolutely uh, germane to your point, which is that the, the, China's on the rise. You know, 
China is not where it was in 1980 or 1990 or 2000 or 2010 or 2015. China is in a transformed position. And it is dealing with a world and an international system and a set of international institutions with certain forms of representation which are a, really a product of the past. So there has to be an adjustment in the American position. America doesn't dominate the world like it did. And it's finding it extremely difficult to come to terms with this. You know, it is in the American DNA to think it is number one in the world. And the fact of the matter is it is no longer number one in the way that it was before. It, is, it needs, in the first instance, to share the world with China. Of course, share the world with many countries. I think the problem is that over the last several years, the relationship has become more and more antagonistic. And so, you know, we're sort of, you know, we're throwing things at each other. Now, my, but I would personally hold the United States primarily responsible for that. And I suspect uh, Lawrence Summers might well go along with that vis-a-vis -vis Trump, but he was very cautious diplomatically. I understand mm -hmm. uh, his reaction yeah. in relationship yeah. uh, to that. Okay, finally, we also talked about, between me and Mr. Summers, we also talked about the possibility of cooperation. Here's what he had to say. I think we do need um, to have much calmer and rela relations and relations with much more mutuality. And I'm sure that when China admits to past errors, when China acknowledges uh, the steps that it has uh, taken that were outside of international norms, I'm sure the United States will be prepared to recognize that it has made mistakes as well. But I don't honestly think uh, that the approach you're taking uh, in this interview, which is to keep turning each issue into a failure of American uh, diplomacy and a American provocation with China as the victim. I don't think uh, that will be regarded as intellectually serious uh, around uh, the world. And so I would hope that in your future dialogues uh, with the United States, uh, you would recognize that there's a lot that is hugely important and beneficial between our two countries, but that we need to uh, work on it in an approach of uh, reciprocity. And I think that's the approach that the American people and uh, their political leaders um, are likely uh, to, uh, to want to follow. And, I think it can be a quite promising uh, approach. But if you suggest uh, that there haven't been any provocations on uh, the Chinese side um, and that it's only the United States that needs to adjust, that's not in my, all honesty, that's not uh, my point. much as, it, much as I not. regret it, I don't think that's going to be a constructive basis going no, forward. No, that has not been my approach. Um, I would let the audience judge whether I have been reasonable, whether I have really uh, listened very attentively to the points that you wanted to make. And, uh, yeah, I'm not going to say anything anymore, but I really appreciated you coming on our show and being frank and uh, sharing with us your very important perspective. Uh, uh, definitely a lot of things to be contemplated on, on both sides. So, Martin, there you go. Uh, he was <laughs> criticizing me for not being intellectually serious enough in that conversation. Um, I'm not, I, I don't want to defend myself, but just the points that he wanted to make about mutuality, reciprocity, what is your feedback? I understand his point about international norms, but you can't freeze international norms. I mean, yeah, sure, China needs to respect them, uh, but you can't freeze them. They, you know, the, the, China, we're in a different world now. So therefore, China's behavior, what can China can do in certain situations, is shifting. You know, I mean, Belt and Road is, is a huge project which is going to ch change the world. 
Uh, where does that fit into existing international norms? Uh, it doesn't in any easy sense, but it is, it is, it is, uh, but it's not an abrogation, violation of them either. So, you know, international systems and international norms are not frozen. Uh, if they were frozen, we'd still have, you know, in the 19th century, the colonial era, era of tyranny, we would have then the Cold War, then the get, 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 get between the Soviet Union and the United States, yeah. then you move into another phase. And now we are moving into a new, uh, a new phase, and this makes it very complicated. And all I would say uh, in relationship to China's position is, yes, it does need to move with great caution. It does need to uh, avoid uh, harsh uh, rhetoric. It does need to avoid verbal provocation. By and large, it has done, but not always. Martin Jakes, author of When China Rules the World, commenting on my previous interview with Lauren Summers, former U.S. Treasury Secretary. We'll take a short break, and when we return, the high seas, cyberspace, and even scientific research are front of China-U.S. tensions. But we started the year with an agreement. How have China-U.S. ties soured after starting the year with some progress? Stay with us.